Please join in the call to worship. We gather on this Lord's Day around the Lord's table to celebrate with thanksgiving the saving acts and presence of Christ. Who reconciles us to God and unites us with one another. Who shapes us to servants and us to ministry. Come, let us worship the one who said, Do this in remembrance of me. Be seated. Trusting that the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, let us join together in the prayer of confession. Let us pray. Lord of the table and towel, hear our confession. You invite everyone. Our guest list is selective. You welcome us to the seat of honor. We worry about what we will wear. You wash our feet. We worry about our calluses. You treat us like royalty. We hope our enemies are jealous. Lord of the table, forgive our sin. Wash fresh our spirits and clothe us in garments of hope. Renew in us the gift of hospitality and give us neighbors to love. With body broken and blood shed, Jesus poured Himself out for us and for the world. Hear and believe this good news. By the grace of that Jesus Christ, you and I have been forgiven. Hear this good news 
and be at peace. And friends in Christ, in response to this gift of God's grace, how then shall we live? With gratitude, following after the Lord Jesus Christ, who calls us to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. This is the way of Jesus in whom we find life. like to invite all of the young Christians to come down front with me. And I'm going to see, have you sit right there, I think, because so you can see the communion table, because it's kind of different today, right? Oh, yeah, it's a little bit different today. Not, not sort of the way it does. We've got fabric cloth that came from all over the world because it's World Communion Sunday. And a little bit later, Davis and David and Peter and William are going to be carrying in breads from different countries to show that not everybody eats Morita bread. Uh, people in other countries celebrate communion with breads from their, that, that they grow and make wherever they live. So, to think about what World Communion Sunday's like, I want to try something. I haven't done this a long time in a long time, so bear with me. Maybe you've done this before. I'm going to cut a piece of paper in half, approximately. I'm going to fold it in half like that. Then I'm going to fold it in half again. And I'm going to fold it in half again. Let's see if this works. Okay, then I'm going to cut it. Cut it like that. And that. And let's see, and like that. And like that. And like that. I'm making kind of a mess, aren't I? I may need your help cleaning up. Let's see if this works. See if I did it right. And let's see if I did it right. What we should have is people holding hands. See? Oh. Yay! Like that. Now, and if we did another one, what we could do, and I want you to pretend like this is a world, a globe of the world, and if we did another one, we could take them and we could put them all the way around here and we'd have people holding hands all the way around the world right that's kind of what and when you go home you can try and see if you can do it too that's what world communion sunday is like it's like all the people who love jesus and follow jesus all around the world holding hands that's jesus's family and it's such a big family that if we all held hands, we would fit all the way around the world. Is that not cool? And that's what's happening today. I want you to imagine when we take communion today, other people all around the world are doing that too. But you know what's wrong with this? Do you know why this doesn't exactly remind me of Jesus' family? Well, because they're paper, and they all look exactly alike. They all have the same color and the same shape. Is that the way you all look? Do you all all look exactly alike? No, you were special. I know. Well, the special thing about Jesus' family is that Jesus' family looks like this. Okay, now that looks a bit more like it. 
Does that look like Jesus' family? Yes. yes. That looks like a more fun family to belong to, and that's what Jesus' family is like all around the world as we hold hands and come to his table. So will you have a prayer with me? Thank you, God. Thank you, God. For making us all different. For making us all different. And for making us all one family. And for making us all one family. Holding hands that reach around the world. Holding hands that reach around the world. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. What comes next? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Pray with me, please. Gracious God, we are so thankful to be together on this beautiful Holy Communion Day. We come with humble hearts and open minds and spirits in thanks for your forgiving power and love and for your word which is at our fingertips. May we always reach for it in every day we live and especially this morning, Lord, open our hearts so that we hear your message and feel your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Last Sunday, in our preparation for community class, we talked about some big ideas, such as communion and sacrament and covenant and Eucharist. What all of these big ideas want to say is that we have been brought into a kind of kinship. Jesus called it the kingdom. But we could also think of it as the kingdom because we are all tied to each other in a way that's every bit as thick as blood. Jesus brought people into this common bloodline by breaking bread with them and by breaking through all kinds of taboos and boundaries so that he could eat with anyone and everyone. So last week we discovered that there are so many stories in the Gospels about Jesus sharing meals with people. Here are just a few of them. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed Jesus. As Jesus sat down to have dinner at Matthew's house, other tax collectors and sinners were sitting with them. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And I say to you that many shall come from east and west and take their place at the table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now while Jesus was at Bethany, attending a dinner party in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with a jar of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head 
as he sat at the table. But when the disciples saw it, they were angry and said, what a waste. This ointment could have been sold and, given, and the money given to the poor. But Jesus said, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. When it was evening, the disciples came to Jesus and said, send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. Jesus said, bring them to me. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And everyone ate and had more than enough. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body. As they came near the village to which they were going, Jesus walked on, but they urged him saying, stay with us because it is almost evening and the day is nearly over. So he went in with them, and while he was at table with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened so that they recognized him. Listen. I'm standing at the door, knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with you, and you with me. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, give us ears to hear new messages in words written long ago, and give us minds to imagine new possibilities in practices that go back to the upper room so that our hearts might be ignited by the fire of your spirit which is always being kindled anew. Amen. In these days of two career families, fast food and extracurricular overkill, I'm afraid that the family table may soon be on the list of endangered species. Whereas the children of my generation were expected to take their appointed place every evening at the table to partake of a meal mother had been struggling with for hours. Now it's common occurrence for dad to swing by Wendy's on his way home and feed the kids on the fly in a room many of us still call the family room. Kicking it up a notch, one mom told me recently that her children regularly eat dinner in the back seat of the car while they're being transported to soccer and gymnastics and martial arts and ballet. So it appears that the family table What's the place where the heartbeat of family life 
could be heard the most audibly, could become a relic of bygone days, or as my anthropology professor used to say, a Neolithic hangover. When our kids were entering high school and middle school, Ted and I decided to reinstitute the family mealtime. We were shocked by the resistance we got from Katie and Todd, who preferred microwave pizza and reruns of Family Matters to the casserole and meandering conversation featured at the family table. You don't have to like it, we insisted, but you do have to go along with it, and one day you'll thank us for it. To which Katie replied, you mean like having my ears irrigated? <laughs> the family table. If someone had told me as a child that one day I would have to bribe my children to come to it, I would have stared at them in disbelief. In my childhood memory, the family table was magical, umbilical, sacramental. Not only was it the place where we came to receive physical sustenance, it was more importantly the place where we were fed emotionally and spiritually. When we were tired, it was at the table that all the weariness got soothed out of us. When we were worried, it was at the table that our anxiety was set to rest. When we had experienced some sort of setback, it was at the table that we gained the courage to get up and do it again. We actually had two family tables during my growing up years. The first one was built like a booth in a restaurant. It had a black top and it put the children at a decided disadvantage since we couldn't leave the table without crawling over or under our parents who sat like two sentinels on the outer ends of the seats. It was at that table that I remember making crater lakes out of mashed potatoes and gravy, being guilted into eating my vegetables by hearing the story of the little green pea that was grown just for me and being subjected to a nightly quiz taking from the Reader's Digest column, it pays to enrich your word power. I turned cartwheels when we outgrew that table and regrouped around a large pine table that was round and had a lazy Susan in the middle. It was around that table that my dad announced plans for our first out-of-state trip together for building an addition to the house and for moving from Asheboro to the big town of Salisbury. It was around that table that my mother announced she was going back to work as one of the first family life educators in a North Carolina high school. And it was at that same table that she told us she was retiring because she was unexpectedly expecting, which really blew her credibility in the classroom. <laughs> Around that table, Mickey Eford and Zachary Pehoff both interim pastors at our church held the whole family spellbound as they told stories about congregations in other towns and in other parts of the world. Who knew there were Presbyterians in other parts of the world? And it was under that table 
shielded from sight by a long tablecloth that my brother and I hid when mom and dad hosted their Thursday night bridge club. There we could eavesdrop on adult inner secrets while feasting on forbidden food artfully filched from the lazy Susan overhead. <laughs> For over half a century, that table provided the common ground where five very different people could share their laughter and their tears. And now that that table has passed on to us, it's where I feel the most keenly the abiding presence of those who have taken their place at the kingdom table, the kingdom table, where those family ties we talk about in our baptism and communion liturgies finally become real for us. That the table has a magnetic quality drawing individual family members from their separate struggles to its life-giving center was certainly true for Jesus' family. And by that, I mean his followers. Because in Luke 8.21, Jesus said, those who hear the word of God and put it into practice are my mother and my brothers, my relatives. Throughout his ministry, Jesus brought his friends to the table, not only to take nourishment, but also to take counsel with each other, to take stock of their kingdom-building mission. Most of all, to take pleasure in Jesus' company. I think the church has often been guilty of portraying Jesus as something of a deadbeat, not the sort of person you would put at the top of your guest list for a party. But if Jesus was anything less than the life of the party, how do we explain the way people throng to him, even left their old lives behind, in order to be a part of the new human community Jesus was creating. Surely the disciples basked in his companionship at the table. And remembering all the times that they had broken bread together, that time when a few loaves and fish fed thousands, the time when that rich tax collector was converted and was so thrilled he, he threw a party for God. The time when that very proper dinner party was crashed by a woman from the street. Remembering all of those meals on the night that he was going to be arrested Jesus invited his family to take their places at the table. I can picture him looking with love at every last one of them and then saying, how eagerly I have desired to share this meal with you. Then he took the bread and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. Those four verbs appear over and over again. He took, he blessed, he broke, and he gave. And he said, do this not only to remember who I am. Do it to remember who you are. Come to the table and take hold of your true identity. And they did. After
after the resurrection, that small band of men and women who were close to Jesus, they didn't go far from the upper room. In his absence, just as when he was with them, they gravitated to their family table because the world outside was hostile to their enterprise, and they needed the manna of encouragement Jesus had promised to give them every time they gathered there. And when we read in the book of Acts that while they were all together in one place, the Holy Spirit came upon them with so much voltage that the whole room shook. It's not too far-fetched to imagine that the stage upon which that frame-bending friend made an entrance was that familial, familiar scene of everyone huddled together around the table. There are lots of pictures of the Last Supper. I have a favorite one. And I know you can't see this, but if I tell you it's the picture hanging in my office, I'm afraid you'll all get up and leave and go to my office. So perhaps some of you have been to Glendale Springs, North Carolina, and a small church there is uh, the fresco art of artist Ben Long. This is my favorite picture of the Lord's Supper because Jesus and the disciples aren't sitting statue-like behind the table like they're posing for an Olin Mills photograph. They look more like a group of real people who have known one another at their best and at their worst. They're not holding their tummies in. They've come to the table in complete candor. The other thing that I love about this picture is that our eyes are drawn to an empty seat, a stool that's right here, front and center, upon which Jesus' gaze is unmistakably riveted. When I met the artist, I asked him, whose seat is that? And he asked me my name. I told him, and he said, Moffat, that seat is for you. That's the seat that's been reserved especially for you. The Holy Supper is set within, and the thousand candles shine, the ballad goes. But I have waited long for you before I poured the wine. That is the seat that's been saved for each one of you and for everyone in Jesus' family. The table around which we gather today is not just a beautiful piece of furniture. It's our family table. Of all the furniture in this sanctuary, this is the most social, the most relational. And we're meant to approach it the same way we approach all of the other special tables in our lives. The tables around which we hear good news and learn to live with devastating news. The tables around which we often come deflated and leave recharged, sometimes even ready to set the world on fire. This is where our decisions are to be made, our confessions are to be heard, our crosses are to be shouldered, our victories celebrated. Because if the Spirit of Jesus has even a ghost of a chance of getting under our skin so that we
come out of our hiding places and face whatever challenges lie ahead. It will be because we have first claimed this as the one place that we know will always have a place and the one place where no matter our differences, we always stand on common ground. Welcome to our family table. Welcome to the one place on earth as it is in heaven. We can always call home. To God be the glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Please be seated. As we gather around this bountiful table, the symbol of God's generosity to us, we are invited to be generous as we stand in God's presence with hearts overflowing with gratitude as we offer ourselves with gladness to God. Let us dedicate ourselves and our gifts as we pray. Lord God of grace, pour out your blessing upon us as we present ourselves and our offerings to you. Receive these offerings as expressions of worship 
And as we place ourselves as living sacrifices before You, hoping that You will find a good use for us, that we might discover the joy which comes to us when we fulfill our holy purpose. To the glory of Your name and for the sake of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. The banquet is prepared, the table is set, 
All of God's children are invited to the feast, the young and the old, the frail and the hardy, everyone with whom you've ever shared a meal and everyone with whom you've never shared a crumb. On this World Communion Sunday, we approach the table with an acute sense of gratitude, remembering that our family includes sisters and brothers we will never meet from neighboring towns and distant worlds who are gathering at their tables, singing in their languages, celebrating the reality that we are one family throughout the earth. Celebrating, too, that this is the one place that we are promised that we will feast in heaven as we have on earth. It is our custom to hold the bread and cup until everyone has been served so that we may partake together. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to our Lord, our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, O God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. Even when we turned away and our love for you failed, your love remains steadfast. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Jesus healed the sick, fed the hungry and ate with sinners, and he still does. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, together with brothers and sisters around the world, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith that Christ has died, that Christ is risen, and that Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by His blood. By Your Spirit, make us one with Him, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at His heavenly banquet, where, along with the angels of heaven, we will forever sing Your praise. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us to pray, let us pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the and power, the power and, the and the glory forever. forever. Amen. It is perhaps our oldest and most oft-told story that on the night when Jesus was betrayed, He gathered at table with His closest friends and He took bread and blessed and broke it. And He gave it to them as we ministering in His name give it to you. And He said, this is My body which has been given for you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me.
And Jesus said, take and eat. After they had eaten, Jesus took a, a cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant, the new relationship with God made possible by my blood poured out to forgive the sins of the world. Whenever you drink it, do it to remember me.